All right, thank you all. This is like, uh, it's like my kids' classroom. Uh, it's like at their school passing time. Everybody's coming in, they stopped by their locker, they got some coffee, they're kind of coming into, their, uh, into the classroom. So uh, everybody come on in. All three of you are speaking? Okay. All right, let's go and get started. So please help me welcome far, uh, parts of the, uh, uh, the Facebook team. We'll start it off with Sri going over uh, the topic 100G uh, fabric testing. Morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sri. I support the Release to Production Network pod at Facebook. Uh, today we're here to talk about uh, testing to enable 100G uh, fabrics at scale. Thank you. So um, Abhijit will be covering the optical interconnect testing. Ashwin will be talking a little bit more about our automation uh, efforts, and I'll be covering some of our testing with the direct attached cables. When thinking about the Facebook network, there are several components. Uh, we would like to think that they marry together well when we focus on the following factors. Uh, operational efficiency, driving commoditization of hardware from a cost perspective, accelerating innovation, Facebook definitely uh, tries to drive that in the industry, and standardization, uh, driving standardization as much as possible. So we built the Facebook hardware, uh, which is optimized both from a bottom-up perspective uh, for data, data center use uh, when thinking about operational aspects, um, and from the top down, from an application perspective, to make sure it serves the Facebook needs. So all the hardware that you see here eventually ends up in our data centers. And we, we try to control as, as many aspects of it as possible to make sure it meets our requirements. But when thinking about uh, test, network testing the OCP rack, especially uh, in, in the perspective of scale, the following are the areas of focus. Uh, from a component perspective, we definitely have to worry about the top of rack switch. Um, we have to uh, look at the network interconnect card, which is actually connecting the server to the rest of the network. Um, and from an interconnect perspective, we look at the uplink optics and we look at the direct attached cables. The cables connect the servers to the top of rack switches. And how all these uh, units marry together at the rack level uh, and interoperability becomes a significant uh, area of focus. And finally, uh, how do we scale the solution and monitor it so that it's serving our entire hardware lifecycle of three or five years? With that, I'll pass the mantle to Abhijit to talk about uplink optics in the fabric network. Abhijit. Thank you, Shri, and good morning, everybody. So I will, I'll talk about on the optical interconnects, uh, how we did the validation process at Facebook. So, so this is the current uh, fabric uh, structure, what we have at Facebook. And as you see, the rack switches are connected to the fabrics and then the spine. So we are moving uh, from the 40G multi-mode structure to the 100G single mode structure by using a technology called CWDM4 and the form factor is QSMP28. So uh, this is the vendor qualification process which we followed at the Facebook. So when we started the 100G CWDM4 validation, it was at uh, infant stage. So basically most of the uh, vendors, they were at the development stage. And the motive here was to help the vendor by doing the validation at Facebook and the guide the vendor so that they can move fast. So the first block diagram, as you see, it's the product fit. So the product fit is like we wanted to understand can we, how uh, good we can use these optical interconnects for our applications. The second part was the design verification where we did the component level validation as well as the system level validation to find out uh, the performance of the product. Then it comes the robustness of the product which is comes from the industry standard qualification test like Telcordia, Mill standard, those kind of testing. So once we got the confidence on this product, we wanted to do a pilot run of the production and the large scale level testing. And now, we are, as you know, we are deploying these 100G CWDM4 
at our uh, data center. So that's why the scale manufacturing is important. And we are also working very closely with all of our vendors and guiding them how to improve this process. So coming back to the validation process, so what we did, we did uh, component level testing, as I mentioned, where we tried to find out the transmitter and the receiver health by characterizing them in terms of average optical power, optical modulation amplitude, rise time, fall time, those kind of part. And also, on the, we wanted to find out the link health by validating, by characterizing the sensitivity, which gives you both transmitter and the receiver side. And last but not the least, the power consumption is a very important role. So basically, we try to figure out uh, how these power consumption are behaving over temperature. So once we got the confidence at the component level, we wanted to find out by using our uh, switch platforms, what we use in the tor level, or as, as well as in the fabric level. So we did a control level tra traffic test by using different frame sizes, different patterns, and multiple number of uh, uh, iterations, and also over time, like three days, five days, seven days, to find out that how this technology is uh, performing over temperature and over time before we deploy it at our data center. So, Currently, we, we are deploying these 100G CWDM4 at our data center. So since uh, it is a very uh, new technology, and Facebook, I believe, is one of the few companies who are deploying these 100G CWDM4, so performance monitoring is very important role, which is post-production. So basically, as you see, most of the information for CWDM4 you can get from the DOM. So basically, supply voltage, uh, temperature, TX power, RX power, and the TX bias, those kind of uh, parameters we monitor very closely right now because we are seeing several uh, early failure modes. We really want to understand it more uh, thoroughly, and we want to guide all the vendors so that we can run our data center smoothly. So basically, as you see some of the picture on the right-hand side, we are seeing some kind of, as an example, like some SMSR issues, which is side mode suppression ratio as well as some, some uh, spectral widening, those kind of issues we are seeing. But uh, these are very early stage, and we are, we are working with all of our vendors closely to improve this process. Uh, next, we will talk about the DAC interconnects. So uh, we employ direct attached cables uh, to uh, interconnect between the network interconnect card and the top of rack switch. Uh, now, so from a DAC perspective, we have a fair number uh, deployed in the fleet right now. Um, and the scale was uh, fairly smooth. We use uh, two major kinds. There's a 2 by 50 gigabit Ethernet uh, uh, Y split DAC, and, uh, uh, which is usually termed as a Q to 2Q DAC. And then there's also a Q to 4S DAC, which is a 4 by 25 gigabit Ethernet split. Um, and when thinking about DAC, we found that interoperability plays an important role uh, with the NICs and the top of rack switch. And we also found that uh, the rack mechanical process uh, ha has a role to play in making quality racks for, for uh, the data center use. So here are a couple of interesting anomalies that we found when uh, characterizing direct attached copper cables. Uh, the uh, graph to the left, uh, left shows the insertion loss suck out as a function of frequency. We've, we correlated this back to the construction of one of the DAC cables and uh, were able to actually fix it. Um, on the right side, you can see there is actually a deviation in the characteristic impedance uh, in a time domain reflectometry plot. Um, when, and that was on a Q to 4S cable, and the TDR was done from the SFP side. We found that this could actually uh, significantly affect end-to-end -end performance. Um, of the of the link coming from the tor to the NIC. So when thinking about DACs, the following factors are uh, we think are uh, some of the takeaways. Uh, when selecting the DACs, balance the thickness with the handling requirements at the rack level. Uh, select the right gauge cables to meet the signal integrity performance that you need. Uh, bending, looping, torsion, flex, these kind of tests actually matter. So encourage your vendors to do that. 
and uh, test reliability to the appropriate standards. Pick your standards to your, your suited needs and have the vendors actually execute that. A few quick thoughts on interop, interoperability. When thinking about interoperability, we slice it along the lines of selecting the components, trying to understand the underlying physics, uh, working with the vendors to build the right tools and metrics, and selecting the appropriate benchmarks to test those, and finally, deploy those in the field and learn from deployment. Um, note the last point, we definitely uh, have monitoring tools to enable the learning from deployment. So in this case, you're looking at a scattered diagram of a link quality proxy that we developed with our vendors and correlated that against system level error events that we see, uh, which are CR CRC checksum errors uh, on the NIC side. What you're seeing here is a very strong correlation between link quality and the CRC checks, uh, CRC errors that occur at the system level. Um, so th these kind of metrics are really useful to help you assess the quality of the final build of the rack. A few quick notes on monitoring. Our mo high level monitoring mantra is to detect issues early on and find the root cause faster. So we have aggregate dashboards that we try to build and understand the health of the underlying hardware so that whenever there are big exceptions, we uh, get to the bottom of it as soon as possible. The interesting fact is that the top of rack switch at Facebook actually is used to monitor the r rack and power health. So the power health of the rack is monitored by the top of rack switch. So when thinking about rack and power health, we're thinking about two major components, the power supply unit and the battery backup unit. Uh, the following factors are monitored with the top of rack switch uh, as far as the PSU is concerned. Uh, power, current, voltage, those are the physical parameters and temperature. Uh, component health, we use alarms to trigger on bad components and component failures and indicate our, uh, to our technicians to replace those. And then firmware upgrades basically are uh, uh, a means to make sure the PSU health is maintained when the vendor supplies new software to control the PSU. On the BBU side, we look at uh, physical parameters again and the major components such as charging status and connection losses. With that, I'll hand it over to Ashwin to talk about automation, a key piece in ensuring quality of the rack. Thank you, Sri. With the scale of deployment, uh, with the diversity of the components in the fleet, the complexity of the system, and the short time period between ideation to deployment, the only paradigm that effectively enables our success is automation. Automation in itself brings advantages like robustness, reliability, repeatability of tests, and recording of test results for future analysis. Issues in hardware are very expensive. It takes us a lot of time and effort to analyze, debug, and uh, fix issues in production. Hence, we proactively enable hardware health and we do this through our three-dimensional approach to hardware testing, which is powered by automation. First of all, we scale our tests across a large number of devices. So this helps us in catching anomalies with the physical and mechanical issues so that we are better prepared to uh, deal with such issues in production. Secondly, we have observed that running the same test a large number of iterations helps us in isolating issues, for example, race conditions. Finally, regression is not free. So we handpick quality, sanity, smoke, feature functional, component integration, performance, scaling and performance, stress test, regression, etc. Our tests are designed such that they are not dependent on any particular test framework. They are uh, framework agnostic. So we have many testing frameworks inside uh, Facebook, and each one has its pluses and minuses. We also uh, direct our vendors and uh, guide them with uh, the tests that we require. Uh, and they can run these tests in their own test infrastructures, and we can leverage the results, which will help in uh, reducing the hardware lifecycle and also in comprehensibility of testing. Facebook is committed to uh, driving industry innovation and uh, setting industry standards. Uh, we also take a lot of uh, uh, industry initiatives when it comes to hardware testing. One such platform where we enable testing of hardware outside Facebook is our activity with the University of New Hampshire, specifically the IOL plug fest. Here, we provide IOL with uh, reliably tested hardware as a frame of reference, and the academia and the vendors can use uh, this hardware as a frame of reference to design, uh, test, and validate components and FRUs like 
optics, DACs, cables, and even software. As you've been hearing, disaggregation is our mantra. By decoupling components, system, and software, we drive flexibility. This has driven interoperability in the industry. So because of this flexibility and interoperability, this adds a new complexity to our testing. But because of this complexity, we do more tests, and it ensures hardware quality. At Facebook, we believe in moving fast. So because of uh, our flexibility, uh, we can uh, develop features fast and deploy them in production because we are now no longer dependent on this big monolithic system. Also, we can pick and choose the components from the market with the best features uh, and customize uh, our uh, solution to optimize the use case. All these things reduces the total cost of operation uh, down. So this is a brief uh, summary of our philosophy and uh, how we uh, test hardware, uh, especially 100 gig in our fabrics at scale uh, and ship love. Uh, it's, I, I believe that uh, this has created a big impact, not just within Facebook, but also across the industry. Thank you, everybody. There's a question back there. Yeah. Hello? 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 Uh, this is Febin. Uh, say when you decide on uh, optic standard for fabric, right? So you said uh, CWDM4. Uh, did you look at other options like PSM4 or uh, other type of optics, and how did you decide on, say, CWDM4 CW is the best way forward? So basically, uh, when we uh, started this program, uh, as you mentioned, PSM4, uh, we have uh, the fiber management. Uh, we, we looked on through the fiber management. Like PSM4, you have four fibers, right? And four going out, four coming back. So basically, we thought of uh, doing CWDM4, which will be less uh, uh, fiber, like it's just one fiber solution. So that was one of the most important uh, thing we kept in our mind and we wanted to go. But there are some other reasons uh, which we can talk. Uh, if you are interested, we can talk more. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, here we are. Hold on a second. I was just curious um, how disaggregation of your systems impacts cabling in terms of uh, volume. I mean, do you find that there's more cabling, less cabling, or basically the same amount of cabling in a disaggregated system? I think uh, when Ashwin was referring to disaggregation, he was talking about the top of rack switch and the various components of it. Uh, when you're referring to disaggregation, you're probably referring to separation of storage and compute elements. Uh, when separation of storage and compute elements happen, it does tend to increase the no amount of interconnects we need at the high level. Another question? Sure. Uh, you guys talked about the, uh, the qualification tests that you do in your, as part of your testing. Are those tests uh, available for, to the rest of the community? For the optics testing, uh, what we have done is like we followed the standard process, the industry standard process, like characterization of TX, RX. Uh, and we also share all these, our validation tests with all of our vendors, uh, we ever needed. And we can definitely, if somebody wants uh, to know uh, how to build those kind of test setup, we'll be more than happy to share with uh, the community. Uh, plus, uh, for each of the hardware components uh, talked about here, uh, if you go to the OCP website, we've already contributed some test plans, uh, including for the top of rack switch and so on. And certainly, that's a good resource for you to leverage. Yeah. Uh, just, just to answer another point on, on your question, like the most challenging part, what we have seen so far, is the system level testing, uh, which is uh, the switch platform level testing. But we have the uh, test methodologies, and we also share that with uh, the
the rest of the community who ever need it. You mentioned ILL earlier, are you in New, the app of New Hampshire. Are you going to um, release any of the reports that you did with them and make those open as well? So some of the optics that you had, are you going to release those so people can then take those to you and use those as well? So I think uh, the, uh, I'll let uh, Ashwin comment on those as well. So it is a continuous process. So uh, our philosophy with uh, going uh, uh, with the IOL is basically to open our hardware testing to the vendors so that the vendors can come and uh, basically uh, test uh, the, their things. So if, if there's a startup, for example, coming up with a new optic, they can go to the plug fest and uh, qualify their optics. Or same thing with network operating systems. So it is a continuous process, so it's not like a one-time event. So it, it happens uh, every uh, X, uh, number of months. and. Uh, uh, we will, uh, so the University of New Hampshire, so they will take the onus of uh, sharing the results. So it is, the testing is collectively owned by the university as well as the vendors. Yeah, so it, I, it is our intent, so now speaking as Facebook, not as OCP, you're part of OCP, but, uh, you know, working with uh, UNH, much like other companies are working with UNH, uh, so that uh, uh, as we give our components and then encourage our vendors to come test there, then UNH can publish those results just like they do for everybody else. But that is testing that's done, you know, independently by UNH, which is separate from some of the testing that's being done uh, by the team. <laughs> I think at the high level, that's outside the scope of this. Yeah. But actually, so if you are interested, there is a session at uh, 2.30. Um, 2.30 where we're covering, uh, in particular, the type of optics that we are uh, advocating, this uh, CW, CWDM4 OCP, and I think that would be a great uh, chance to kind of talk with the folks there, with the team there who is, who is going to talk about the benefits of it, but also advocate, or talk about how we're also working with UNH to do that testing with those vendors that support that, uh, that standard. Anything else? All right. Oh, here we are. Thanks. Yeah, you just mentioned that you use a TAR to monitor the uh, rack power um, because we just talked about the Sonic uh, as a white box, uh, as a TAR. So do you expect that kind of part of the feature we can add into the TAR as a white box? I think uh, some of the control mechanism to monitor the power supply actually comes with the OpenBMC option. So if you uh, take OpenBMC with your Sonic Tower, you should be okay. Yeah. And that's a, yeah, that's actually something that uh, I think newly we announced. You know, both Facebook and Microsoft that Sonic is is being worked on with uh, NSI on top of the Wedge 100, which is you know, our top of rack. Right, so that's, that's still pretty early, but you know, that's something that we could look at. Right. Okay, so uh, thank you all very much. Please help me thank the, the speakers again. So we've got a lunch break. Uh, the, just as a reminder, I don't know if, if uh, folks are interested, but the one o'clock session has been canceled here. So there's only one talk in networking track, but then we'll resume back in this room at 1.30 uh, with more networking talks. All right, thank you all.